What's up, everyone? This is Anthony Pompliano. Most of you know me as Pomp. You're listening to the Pomp Podcast, simply the best podcast out there. Now let's kick this thing off. Balaji Srinivasan. He's the author of a brand new book, The Network State. In this conversation, we do a little bit of a history lesson. We talk about the network state, how it works, why it's so important, and how Balaji anticipates this coming to fruition. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I could have talked to Balaji for many more hours. Before we get into this episode, though, I first want to talk about our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Copper. Since 2018, Copper has been at the forefront of institutional digital asset development. From award-winning custody solutions to creating the first truly off-exchange settlement function, Copper pioneers technology, products, and services in lockstep with a rapidly changing world. No other infrastructure provider covers as many assets across as many exchanges with the speed and security that Copper can offer. To learn how Copper helps the world's largest institutional investors secure their digital assets, head over to copper.co. Again, Copper, the unfair advantage. Check them out at copper.co today. Today's episode is brought to you by Exodus, the world's leading desktop, mobile, and hardware crypto wallet. They offer beautiful, user-friendly blockchain products that sync across all of your devices, making it easier to send, receive, and exchange over 150 or more crypto assets in one place. And with world-class customer service available to you 24-7, Exodus always has your back. But the fun doesn't stop with staking and trading. They recently launched a new NFT marketplace where you can buy and sell your favorite NFTs on the Solana network. By partnering with the popular NFT platform Magic Eden, they're offering the full Monty on verified collections with more added every single day. Ready to check it out for yourself? Run, don't walk, over to exodus.com slash pomp for your free download today. Again, if you want the world's leading desktop, mobile, and hardware crypto wallet, go to exodus.com slash pomp today. This episode is brought to you by Bullish. Bullish is a powerful new digital asset exchange built for institutions that delivers the innovations of DeFi in a regulated environment. The bullish hybrid order book pairs the high performance of a traditional central limit order book with the automated market making. Powered by deep bullish liquidity pools backed by the multi-billion dollar bullish treasury. So you can trade with certainty and at scale across variable market conditions. You can learn more at bullish.com or follow bullish on Twitter because the future belongs to the bullish. Now, this is not investment advice. Digital assets and cryptocurrencies are high risk products. Consult your professional advisor before dealing in them. Bullish services are available in select locations only and not to U.S. persons. Visit bullish.com slash legal for important information and risk warnings. Go check them out at bullish.com or follow at bullish on Twitter. Let's get into this episode with Blagi. I hope you guys enjoy it. Anthony Pompliano runs Pomp Investments. All views of him and the guests on his podcast are solely their opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Pomp Investments. You should not treat any opinion expressed by Pomp or his guests as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of his personal opinion. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All right, everyone. I'm very excited about this. Uh, Balaji is here, the network state. I feel like I could just turn it over to you and you could give us a lecture, but uh, maybe we could just start with this idea of um, the network state itself. Like, how does this happen? How do we go from where we are today to one of these being created and actually scaled on a global basis? Okay, great question. So, uh, you know, the book's at thenetworkstate.com. And um, so I think one way of talking about it is first, how does this thing happen? And then second, what happens after it happens, right? So how does it happen? Well, there's a bunch of, uh, so first, what, what are we even talking about? So the network state, uh, you know, I've got both a, uh, a short informal definition than a longer definition. So the informal definition is um, a network state is a highly aligned online community with the capacity for collective action that crowdfunds territory around the world and eventually gains diplomatic recognition from pre-existing states. Now, the thing about that is a network state does not yet exist. People, one of the points I make in this is uh, there's a lot of adjacent things. There's a lot of things that are like similar to network states in a sense, but like Google is not yet a network state. You know, uh, Bitcoin is not, a DAO is not, Um, they're adjacent, but they're not the same thing. And the reason is that they aren't, uh, there's various ways in which they sort of fall short of the definition. For example, um, Bitcoin has, you know, obviously it has, uh, you know, the reserve currency, but it doesn't have a government, doesn't have a 
Um, it doesn't have land. Uh, you know, Bitcoiners, you know, don't agree with each other on many things. Um, it doesn't have the national consciousness that is, uh, you know, what really defines a country. You know, even the term, by the way, nation state, I talk about this a fair bit in the book. You've heard that term before. Uh, but do you know what the difference between the nation and the state is? No, what is it? So most people don't think about that, right? In fact, there's a reason for that because nation comes from the same root word as like natality. So it's like common birth, right? Mm. Common descent, common ethnicity, like the Japanese are the Japanese nation is a group of people, the Japanese people. And then, you know, by the distinction is the Japanese state is like a government that sits over those people. And, uh, you know, that, that Japanese nation could have many different kinds of governments. It used to have, you know, the empire, like Imperial Japan. Now it has like, you know, liberal democratic Japan, but it's like this very thin layer of like a government on top of this enormous body of people. And that is the nation, right? So there's the nation and the state on top of it. And the reason that we don't usually think about that distinction is actually our language and our culture tries to ally the distinction because the state, you know, it legitimizes itself as a represent representative of the nation. For example, when you talk about national security, or this is happening at the national level, right, or international relations and whatnot, right? Much of that is really interstate relations. When you talk about a multinational corporation, it's really like a multi-jurisdictional corporation because it's operating in multiple jurisdictions. And like, you know, just to clarify, what is a nation? For example, I mentioned the Japanese nation, uh, but the the Kurds are a nation, the Catalonians are a nation, right? That's a group of people with sort of a common language and culture and history. But notice that the Kurds and the Catalonians are stateless nations. They say groups of people that are nations, but that do not have a state. How okay? important is having a state for a nation? Like, is it? Oh, it's imp- huge. Huge. Okay. It's huge. Right? I mean, the thing is, uh, there's actually a funny quote. Um, so just to kind of go after this word nation a little bit, uh, you know, you've obviously heard the you know, proper noun, United Nations. Really, it could be called more like the selected nations or the selected nations that happen to have states. Okay. And when you think about it that way, you're like, oh, wow, there's a bunch of ethnic groups that are really legitimate and have a lot of culture and history behind them that in the game of musical chairs, that was sort of the mapping and settling of the world. They just kind of lost out. They didn't get a chair, you know, the music stopped and they didn't get a piece of land to call their own. And uh, so they are stateless nations, Um, you know, and uh, there's a book um, called uh, Invisible Countries by Joshua Keating that talks a lot about these kind of folks. Um, and there's groups like this all around the world, and there are varying sizes. You know, some are small, some are large. Um, and the thing is that uh, it was actually funny. Like the president of Kazakhstan recently, um, he actually spoke against the concept of self determination. Um, you know why? No, why? He said. If the principle of self-determination is endorsed, we will go from something like 190 UN member states to something like 600. (laughs) Okay. So there's this enormous jack-in-the-box pressure for people who want their own state and, you know, it would just go like this and you just have this enormous energy of suddenly folks who were not able to self-govern being able to self-govern. Right. Is this why you get and, like people like the Kurds and uh, involved in so such deep conflict, which appears to be over land and, and kind of the statehood yeah. that you're mentioning? That's part of it. For sure. It's part of it. Right. And, you know, many, many conflicts like this are over land. And mm-hmm. that seems like impossible to solve. How would you, you know, fix this issue? And one of the key concepts behind the network state system that I'm proposing is if you know enough history, see lots of things today that we grew up with as constants are becoming variables, right? So, Pomp, you were born in early 80s, late 70s-ish? Uh, right? Late late 80s. I just look older than Ladies. I am. All right. Okay, fine. <laughs> fine. So, you are, you know, basically my contemporary, I'm 1980. Um, so, the, uh, so, the thing is that the stuff that we grew up with, um, for example, just take the, the U.S. dollar, Right. That was a constant up until basically 2009, and suddenly it's become a variable with Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. And 
uh, you know, various things like, you know, the U S world order or, um, you know, the, the things that people thought of as apolitical when they say it's getting political, suddenly there's like factions back and forth on something that you never even thought there'd be a different opinion on. Um, that you thought was just so like fixed that no, no one would care. And that's now a point of contention. Right. And so as once you kind of realize this, that, that, order that was constant is becoming a variable, you apply that to the nation state system itself. And, you know, this has been around for so long that if, you know, anything that you were born into is just kind of the way the world has always been. And uh, you don't necessarily seek to question, especially if it stayed constant for 30 years or 40 years or 60 years or 70 years. But, you know, what preceded the nation state system? So there's a a country called San Marino. You're, uh, you're Italian descent, right? Like, Correct. have you ever ever been there? Like, do you know San Marino? Ever heard of it? Yes. It's like it's like this tiny little thing that's almost like a like a duckbill platypus, like a missing link, you know, between the past and the present. And San Marino, you know, I may be getting the history wrong. Probably, you know, an Italian historian might correct me. But um, when Garibaldi was unifying Italy. Uh, you know, San Marino granted him like a refuge and in gratitude, he kind of left them out of his, you know, unification thing. Right. And most people don't know that, like, you know, the French revolution basically created France and Bismarck created Germany and Garibaldi created Italy. And these were giant feats of social construction. And in fact, nationalism was something that actually in some ways came from the left, at least with the, with the French revolution. Now it's identified with the right, but it came from the left as a way to make all people in this jurisdiction equal. And a lot of the people who we think of as, for example, speaking French, um, I think, uh, gosh, what's his name? Eric, uh, Eric Hobsbawm has a stat. I forget the exact number, but it's like small double digits, whether it's 10 or 20% or something of the territory of France actually spoke French what we think of as a language French at the time of the revolution and a bunch of other people spoke different dialects that got erased by the sort of imperializing campaign of the French revolution to turn it all French. Right Mm -hmm. now, I don't know enough about the linguistic history to know how different those dialects were from French itself or whether they're truly mutually unintelligible and so on. I'm relying on Hobsbawm's account, but I've seen similar things about the formation of Italy, the formation of Germany. So essentially what happened was, there, you know, there's this whole thing you can look at called the German question on whether, um, you know, uh, Prussia and, you know, who was to take the lead in a united Germany? Was it going to be like Prussia or Hanover? And, uh, you know, all of this stuff happened well before people, you know, today were paying attention or are alive, right? But, um, you know, let me see, I'm getting that right on the, the German question, Prussia versus Hanover, right? Um, the best way to achieve a unification of all or most lands uh, and, um, you know, like little Germany versus greater Germany. Right. And um, the, you know, I may be getting some of the details wrong, but the, the fundamental point is that all of these giant states, and they're actually pretty big, right? Like Germany's like 80 million people, like France is like, you know, mm-hmm. 60 million people, like all of these giant states were constructed over the last few hundred years by um, guys like Bismarck, like Garibaldi, um, the you know the you could you know the, the French revolutionaries, uh, and you know you can argue that Napoleon consolidated that revolution, and you know obviously the American revolutionaries, the Russian revolutionaries, uh, you know uh, folks like Mao who unified China, even India was never a unified nation until basically living memory, like the, you know, late forties, early fifties, like 1947, 1950, India, actually, it wasn't just that they got independence from the British. There were 562 princely states that, um, that merged into India. Okay. Modern so, India. So I have a, used to, I have India a, is like, go ahead. I have a question about this exact, uh, time period where a lot of this started to happen. Is it driven by individual, uh, greed and ambition? There was one person said, Hey, I want to unify all of this. Cause then I can control this land. Is there something around, uh, a piece of technology, the invention of corporations? Like wh- why is it that we didn't have this until a certain point in time? And then it feels like the entire world, uh, kind of got unified in these almost like subcultures or, or sub states. Uh, and it happened very sequentially and, and, you know, in the grand scale of things very quickly one after the other. So, you know, The Sovereign Individual, which I think is a good book, uh, I actually have uh, one thing is, um, you know, the book that I've released, The Network State, think of it as a V1. I actually have, you know, maybe under 300 or 400 pages of content that I've got 
uh, you know, that I want to, that I want to put in the director's cut. Okay. So it's only 460 pages right now. So it'll be like a thousand pages. I'm, I'm actually, I'm completely serious. I've got graphs, I've got charts, appendices. I, I do not doubt much- it at all. <laughs> okay. So it's very much the V1. Um, but one section I've got in there are, you know, arguments and counter arguments to the sovereign individual thesis, because the sovereign individual thesis, I think is quite good, but there's also counter arguments against it, which we can digress on or double click on, but just the sovereign individual thesis itself is, that centralization increased, that is to say, um, technology favored centralization for several hundred years. And uh, you had, um, you know, for example, like join and die in the French and Indian War, you had the telegraph, you had uh, railroads, you had mass production, you had mass media, um, you had these gigantic militaries that came from these centralized bureaucracies. All the stuff up until like roughly 1950 favored centralization. You built these giga states, absolutely gigantic empires, the American empire and the Soviet empire, you know, the Nazis, the Japanese empire, all slugging it out over giant quantities of territory because they're huge, you know, returns on scale. And, uh, and moreover, because the communications networks were so centralized, People couldn't argue peer to peer. It became very expensive to set up a, a, a newspaper or to get a TV license. It was highly regulated, highly constrained. So the whole thing got choke pointed through and a few people could basically control massive tens, hundreds of millions of people. And then they just slugged it out in these huge wars of the 20th century. And the ideologies that they propounded were those ideologies that could basically script massive numbers of people. You know, and and then put them into war, basically. And the best of those was democratic capitalism relative to you know communism and Nazism. But it was still a mass ideology that actually did you know blow up a lot of people. It was it was you know the least bad of them. I think I think I would agree. But if you read like Human Smoke or or something like that by Nicholson Baker, you'll see it actually you know had had a lot of negative things. It's not just the Japanese internment, it's, uh, gold seizures. It's you know all the stuff that FDR did, all the stuff Woodrow Wilson did. Blah blah blah. Okay, fine. So. Uh, point is, uh, the sovereign individual thesis says that centralizing force, or centralizing technologies, you know, brought that together, and then decentralization has taken it down. I think that's true. I think it's also something where um, there's both sort of left and right wing forces that, uh, you know, as we would conventionally think of them, that um, happened during this time that were aided and perhaps you know, only even feasible because of technology, but had a feedback effect with it. And there's sort of the left egalitarianism of let us all be citizens. You know, in in the nation of France, nationalism was um, egalitarian relative to the monarchy. And then later was nationalism as a right thing, which is we all need to band together in terms of defense. And basically, you know, German nationalism in part, uh, you know, and again, maybe getting the strong, maybe historical correct, but my understanding is the Napoleonic Wars in part led to the rise of German nationalism because people are like, we need to band together against this insane, you know, French Colossus, like at the time, you know, under Napoleon, French was France was not considered the whatever the surrender monkeys or whatever. They were, you know, the military power of Europe, and Germany was actually the one that needed to get its act together. So, so there are various forces. It was, it was, uh, you know, it was technology. It was left ideologies, right ideologies. Net, net is you had returns on scale for a long time. And now we are seeing with the advent. I think, I think technology is probably the primary driver of it. We're seeing just massive, like negative returns on scale, diseconomies of scale, and the whole thing is decentralizing. And it's decentralizing much, much, much faster than it's centralized. So it's like a centralizing ramp up over multiple centuries, and it's like decentralizing over the span of like one century. Okay, so maybe five x or ten x as fast. Is Go this ahead. the idea of like deglobalization? It is uh, that's kind of how some people try to talk about this phenomenon, but you're basically presenting a different lens on it, but it's this idea that like, we're going to go back to a nationalistic viewpoint and there's less globalization. Yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, I think, uh, so deglobalization is interesting because I'm not sure it'll happen in exactly that way. So Zihan and other guys talk about that, right? And, you know, Zihan, I think, you know, I, I, I probably agree with him like 30%, 20%, something like that. Um, very probably very much disagree on other pieces, but here's my thesis on like globalization, deglobalization, et cetera. Um, first is I think globalization continues online, um, but it goes in reverse offline. So you have like physical nationalism, but you have digital uh, globalization. And that's actually the tension of this century. It is the cloud versus the land. Mm-hmm. You have this global community of 
um, you know, remote working. Because on the one hand, you've got all these trends pushing towards total internationalism, right? You have cryptocurrency, you have remote work, you have Starlink, you have this massive global community of startup entrepreneurs and folks who are more connected than they've ever been. You know, uh, you have encryption, which is cross borders. Um, you have, uh, you know, you, you have all of those things. You have the, the metaverse coming. You have billions of people with smartphones. Um, you have transnational companies. All of those are huge pushes on the digital side for continued globalization and accelerated, in fact, in some ways. On the other hand, you have the land pushing against that, uh, where various countries, various politicians want to retain their control over their jurisdiction. They want to use the state against the network, right? And so it's actually more complicated than simply deglobalization. This is a political axis of um, you know, state versus network. And what's interesting about this is centralization and decentralization, you can actually cut that where in some sense, the state is decentralized because you'd have lots and lots of little pieces around the world if you deglobalized. On their hand, within any jurisdiction, it's centralized. It's a centralized power, right? Mm -hmm. Conversely, the network in a sense is uh, you know, globally centralized because you have a central administrator of a Google or something like that that goes across the whole world. But it's also in a different sense, decentralized because you can have Bitcoin or Ethereum or something like that where your private keys are local across different countries, right? So there's like an interesting aspect of this where you can start slicing this. And I think it's more complicated than simply the world deglobalizes. Um, one other aspect of this, which I think is quite important is um, my mental model is uh, a centralized East and a decentralized West. And then what we want is actually a recentralized center. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why do I say it that way? So a centralized East and decentralized West, the sovereign individual thesis is quite good, but um, you know, anything that's, that's like a huge piece of the future, people often tend to just extrapolate that trend out and they don't account for the Soros concept of so-called reflexivity. Have you heard about that concept? You know what that is? It's one of the it's key kind, concepts kind of, of finance, yes. It was key. Okay, why don't you, exp why don't you explain it then? Yeah, the, the, the whole idea basically is uh, the further that things can uh, move in one direction, uh, they basically can reflexively move back uh, in the other direction just as fast. Um, and, and there's a uh, balance, I think, and human psychology becomes a huge component uh, of that balance and kind of the reaction. There's a reaction to every action uh, in some way, and especially in, in financial assets where uh, right when people are ready to sell, to walk away, to give up, uh, that's usually the time where... Uh, th there's a snapback, if you will, of uh, of those assets. That's right. And you know, the thing is, of course, sometimes things really just do go to zero. Sometimes things, um, you know, actually like you know, venture capital's model, if you think about it, is buy the all time high and hope it goes high. Right. <laughs> that, that that's what it is to be a Series A or Series B investor. You're basically, in a sense, buying the all time high of that stock. Yes. And then hoping it's it goes even higher and you can make money that way, frankly, you can, but um, it is, it is something which is uh, it's certainly atypical relative to how a hedge fund person will think about it. The reason I just bring up reflexivity is um, especially when it's a human trend, it may not go to infinity, right? The fact that it's rising often arouses bandwagoning against that trend. Right. And so with respect to the sovereign individual, I think there's at least three counter trends and those are um, you know, what I call the individual sovereign, uh, the sovereign collective and the autonomous robot. Okay. So the individual sovereign is like somebody like Xi Jinping or Putin or somebody, you know, Elon, somebody like that who has like enough influence over the future that they can turn, you know, even if the trend is towards, uh, you know, decentralization, it's also a trend towards individual empowerment. And someone like Xi Jinping has pushed the entire country towards centralization of a billion people, right? So paradoxically, the sovereign individual talks about how individuals get super empowered. And here's a super empowered individual who is pushing the disempowerment of other individuals, which mm -hmm. is very meta, okay? Um, so that's like, you know, the, the individual sovereign is a fly in the ailment. The second is a sovereign collective, because I think it's challenging for, I, I do think that the size of groups that you need to get something done reduces, but it doesn't like 
Um, it doesn't mean that you don't need other people for anything. It just means it gets smaller. Um, you can do more things with autonomy. You, you can have things like Minecraft or Bitcoin with like one person or Instagram and WhatsApp with double digit numbers of people. That's all true. And I do think the size of groups, you know, shrinks and you have many more CEOs and many more smaller companies. And so on. we're already seeing something like that. Many smaller countries as well. But that doesn't mean it goes to like, I think everybody is just one person or even that there's a group of people that are just like one person. I think people want community and so on. So I think the sovereign collective is another important counterweight to that because, um, you know, the the state will push back on you if you're just an individual on your own, you represent no constituency. The smallest minority is, is one person, I think is like Rand would say. And that's actually why a, prag- a pragmatist uh, realizes, hey, if I can group with other people, I can probably achieve objectives, maybe by sacrificing some individual autonomy. But um, I think the sovereign collective is going to be a big thing, is a big thing, right? And that's crowdfunding, that is, uh, you know, Facebook groups, that is um, a signal, but it's also a big part of the network state. And the third is the autonomous robot, because a lot of the logic of Bitcoin and of the sovereign individual is, well, um, you know, the, the 20th century was about these gigantic wars where, you know, the states could seize all the money and they could seize the money and they could use that for these, you know, planes and tanks and kill each other. And, uh, you know, they could also uh, inflate the currency. And all of that goes away when you have cryptocurrency, right? You've heard, you've heard this thesis. I have. Well, okay. And, and along go along these lines, what, one key piece I think that people uh, don't quite yet I have understand. have a counter-argument. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, okay, sorry, okay. sorry. Uh, but, but just to kind of hit home on this. So in the physical world, obviously, if you have the most powerful offense, you are the you know military dominant uh, um, kind of nation state group, et cetera. Uh, when you push up into the digital world, um, there's still a lot of people who say, hey, atoms matter, right? It's not all just bits. Obviously, if somebody comes and, and uh, takes your computer, puts you in jail, whatever, uh, that that's a, a problem. But there is this concept of like, actually in the cyber world, defense, the strongest defense means that you are more powerful. How do you evaluate offense versus defense in the physical world? And then does that change the evaluation in the digital world? Yeah. So I think the way I kind of connect the two is I've got a section in the book called Rubber Hoses Don't Scale. Okay. So, you know, people always say, oh, the rubber hose attack, haha, ha, lol. You're just some moronic crypto guy who doesn't understand that I can find and beat you up and take your private keys. And then my counter argument against that is, okay, but can you do so at a profit? What I mean by that is uh, the state is not, you know, doesn't have infinite resources. It needs to first take that Bitcoin address or whatever address, and it has to map it to a physical person and then find that person's current location and then have, you know, the the search warrant or whatever that is valid in that jurisdiction because they might be in you know whatever country uh, they have to be able to then land the SWAT team they have to go kick in the door they have to find that guy's private key and they have to hope it's got enough money to pay for that entire process and they have to repeat that over and over again right and if that you know like a SWAT team is actually kind of expensive it costs I don't know how many but like certainly tens of thousands of dollars and um, you better hope that like that coercive seizure is making you more money than it's costing you um, and uh, that it's not resulting in film that will actually make a lot of people think, okay, screw these militarized police, abolish the police, you know, defund the police, you know, resist the police, whatever, whatever. Right. And uh, because if you do use force, sometimes it's the use of force is really complicated because often the use of force, if it's considered illegitimate, can arouse significant backlash that is more, you know, it's just stupid to use force, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's why, like, that's why rubber bullets exist. That's why nuclear bombs just didn't grow to infinity. Why did, you know, for example, a while back, there's this guy, uh, Eric Swalwell, he's like uh, talking about how the US government has nukes. And so therefore nobody can fight back against it. Do do you remember remember this post or tweet from a few years ago? I don't, but that sounds like something that would be on the internet as an argument and detached (laughs) from reality. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, So the reason that's actually a really bad argument is if you actually... Um, think about like the point is not to just like randomly kill lots of people. If you nuked, just to take this stupid thought experiment, but it's actually useful as a thought experiment in this sense. If you actually went and like nuked Dallas or something like that, you'd kill lots of uh, his tribe as well. Right. And it's not a surgical tool because it's not surgical. It can't actually be deployed. Because his goal is to try and bring the other tribe to heal. 
And that means, you know, basically going and killing or, you know, attacking or censoring or deplatforming their guys without hitting his own guys. And so in fractal America, where if you look at the map, it's all of these red and blue cheek by jowl, one side can't really like go and strafe and bomb the other side because in physical space, they're so cheek by jowl that anything is going to hit the other person, right? And so that, that won't get political support from that side. And so instead, the warfare is online. You know, it is, it's very different than the 1860s. In the 1860s, you had these two tribes and they weren't just ideologically separated, but they're geographically separated. North mm-hmm. and South were, were separated, right? You can look at the map. Whereas uh, here, let me actually let me show you some visuals. So maybe you guys can. The first is that's a map of blue and gray, how they're separated in 1861. And if you go to the second one, that's how it looks in 2016. So physically, there's no way you can invade or bomb yep. the, the Swalwell tweet on nuking. Nuking just doesn't work. You're killing too many of your own guys, whatever tribe you're in. And then you go to the third, in the digital space, they're separated. That is actually now that looks like the 1861 map again. And that's why it's so insane online because you have you know this, this front of two groups that are ideologically separated. But because the physical space is so fractal, any kind of conflict is going to look like you know a network war, net war as opposed to 20th century or 1900, you know 1800s war. Um, so, and what so, does that mean? That's well, like well, one of the things that I, I think is really interesting about this is um, when I think of just from personal experience, right? So in Iraq in 2005 through like 2010, there was a program called Sons of Iraq, and what they hmm. essentially did was uh, it was partially in the analog world of we need physical soldiers. We need people to, uh, kind of patrol their local communities, et cetera. Uh, but there was also a psychological aspect of it, which is you are an Iraqi citizen. You probably mm. have some sort of military experience or you have some sort of, uh, um, you know, combat training or, or whatever it is. And we, as the United States said to these individuals, we cannot patrol your whole country. We cannot, uh, be in every single local community. You have to take responsibility. You have to have pride in your country. You have to have, uh, a feeling of, um, kind of responsibility for your local community. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to empower you. We're going to empower you in the analog world. But in some ways that program was never recognized for the psychological component of trying to say, Hey, if you don't want these people who you deem to be bad in your local community, you as the sons of Iraq, you are responsible for, um, you know, setting up checkpoints and keeping people out of your communities, et cetera. And we, as the United States will help. Now, people will argue over the efficacy of the program, but it was trying to combine the analog. We will give you weapons. We will give you training. We will, you know, do all these things, uh, kind of in the physical world, but also psychologically, there had to be a, um, uh, kind of a step function change, if you will, in the way that people thought about, uh, their responsibility or their interaction in their communities. And, you know, the, the proponents of this program would argue it was the turning point. Right. It, it literally changed the kind of battlefield because now all of a sudden you were able to multiply the number of soldiers. And it goes back to this idea of they weren't necessarily enemies coming at you. Right. Because they were kind of uh, more so uh, agnostic and just saying, hey, like, I just want to live my life. I'm not on either side. Uh, but the United States was able to use these individuals to then uh, be helpful for their cause, which, you know, I, I think is a, a past example. But now you're making the argument that that's going to happen on the digital front, not just in the physical world. We understand kind of what's happened in history, right, in terms of how we've kind of got here. Some people understand it better than others. But where do we sure. go from here in terms of what these network states, like w- what do you anticipate will happen? Sure. Okay. So fundamentally what we are having is a situation where because in part of the internet, but also because of trends that predate the internet, this broader decentralization thing You have people in physical jurisdictions where that latent difference is now popping up, right? America is no longer really just a, it's not a nation state, it's a minimum, a a binational state, right? Because you've got red and blue, but you've also got lots of sub ethnicities and so on under that. We're not used to thinking of red and blue as ethnicities, but if you look at marriage patterns, for example, people will now marry outside their race. It's actually, you know, very, very common, um, at least as expressed to pollsters, but they won't marry outside their party. Okay. Democrats won't marry Democrats and Republicans increasingly, uh, or, or Democrats will only marry Democrats and Republicans increasingly will only marry Republicans. That's been trending way up. And the thing is, in a generation, that kind of ideology becomes biology. It becomes at a minimum, Democrat, Republican becomes like 
you know, Protestant Catholic or Sunni and Shiite, right? The ideology becomes a biology. If you're only going and finding a spouse within that group and telling your kids only marry within that group and so on, right? So that, that happens very fast. And then that becomes like ethnic, right? And that becomes like, I shouldn't say intractable because it can be, it can be solved, but it's difficult, harder to solve, right? It's more, it's not really about policy. It's tribe versus tribe. And so the thing is that that is uh, like happening in a lot of places worldwide. And a lot of people don't realize that, uh, you know, they don't know Garibaldi, they don't know Bismarck, they don't know what happened to the French Revolution. They don't realize like how much centralized force in different ways and, and, and propaganda, okay, the combination of both right and left in that sense, you know, um, was required to like flatten out these huge regions and centralize them under certain things. They kind of think that's the way the world always was. But there's an enormous amount of force and an enormous amount of propaganda that leveled all of that out, that kind of erased all of these other dialects in favor of official French or, you know, wiped out all these other small jurisdictions in favor of what we now know as Italy, right? And that was obviously cataclysmic in some ways, but it also resulted in what we think of as a modern world. And now we're getting, I think, the V3, right? So I mentioned San Marino, and it's like this, um, it's like this duckbill platypus. It's like this missing link where if you look at the history of San Marino, um, it actually shows why we exited the city-state age and went to the nation-state age. And a big thing, by the way, is city-state, nation-state, network state is a progression that's sort of similar to like gold um, you know, fiat or dollars and digital gold. You know why I say that? Should I explain that? Explain. So the key thing is that like Bitcoin is, is a V3. We talk about it as digital gold and it has some of the properties of gold, like the immutability and so on. In fact, it improves on some of those properties, the custodial aspect and whatnot. But it actually, and we sort of take this for granted, has many of the same properties as fiat. You can send it electronically. You can represent it on a screen. You can write programs with it, all that type of stuff. Right. And if it didn't have those properties, it wouldn't really be a contender. It would, it would not be, see, it's not a throwback. It's not a V1. It's a V3 that combines aspects of both V1 and V2. And the, right? th the idea there is if it only had the aspects of V1 in a digital form, uh, you would either miss parts of V2, which wouldn't make it competitive, or people would uh, view it as inferior, uh, given that they could send it digitally uh, fiat. But if Bitcoin was somehow physical in nature or something, then obviously it wouldn't work in this digital world. Yeah. So, well, so let's say it was just V1. Let's say it's basically like, you know, and I, by the way, I have nothing against Peter Schiff. Um, I respect him for calling the, you know, mortgage crisis and so on, but he does like to troll Bitcoin. Whatever. Okay, fine. So let's say it's gold. It's Peter Schiff's, you know, beloved thing. And actually, by the way, gold may, may have its own little boomlet or what have you. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the thing about gold is gold was defeated by the state. Right. Executive order 6102, gold was seized. Gold is something that you can detect with metal detectors. Gold is something that is very heavy to transport. Gold is something where you can't easily like chip off a flake and just use it at Starbucks. Right. Gold is not a very easily negotiable instrument. Um, it has lower liquidity than BTC, which is actually quite liquid, you know. And uh, so because of that, uh, like, you know, is, is Bitcoin as liquid as as fiat and can you can you can you um, pay with it as easily as you can a dollar? Not really because the transit you know there's various various constraints on that um, like there's transaction limits and block size and all that type of stuff. Yes, you can use Lightning and what have you. And there's workarounds. I agree, but point is that like uh, gold V1. If you just tried V1, you wouldn't get that far because literally physical blocks of gold are hard to actually pay with. You can use them as emergency storage mechanisms. But they're hard to transport. They're heavy. Um, you know, if you wanted to transport a million dollars of gold, I don't know many how, how many pounds that is off the top of my head, but it would probably be a fairly large amount of of weight to carry, right? So V1 has a lot of downsides, which is why people go with V2. And so before Bitcoin, when people would just sort of be like, "We need gold. We need to go back to sound money," and so on, it's just it was like a, it was directionally accurate in some ways. You know, there's there was a a solid critique in some ways of the problems of the present, but there wasn't like the practicality of how does this new thing um, account for the fact that the present beat the past? If you have, you know, the present beat the past, so whatever you propose as a future needs to be able to beat the present. It's almost like combining in some ways the policies of V1, right? Or, or kind of the structure of V1, but the technology of V2 and yeah, you put those two things yeah, together, you get V3. Yeah, exactly. The specific fusion may differ in different domains, mm -hmm. but the V3 
has to be kind of better than both, right? Um, and often, you know, so I'll give several examples of this, and then let me talk about the network state itself. So, um, you know, you have physical paper, and then you have um, a, uh, a scan document, like a scanner, and then you have like a digitally native file, mm -hmm. which never even exists in the physical world, right? Or you have, you know, a, a, in a different way, you have a paper currency, then you have like um, a bank interface like PayPal, or that's really that's a layer on top of a bank interface, but you, you see your dollars in a bank interface. Then you have cryptocurrency, which is natively digital, or you have, um, you know, you have a uh, movie that you see offline, and then you have like a Netflix, you know, streaming thing where you know you've got a film that's in Hollywood. Then you have internet native content that was authored on the internet, and it's not like streaming from some like Hollywood library, right? And you can kind of think of a lot of things have this progression where there's like physical, there's a physical digital hybrid, like a scan version, then there's a purely digital version. And so, um, you know, so that, that's like, a, that's a progression just within the internet. If we take a longer time frame, we say city state, nation state, network state. The reason that city states, the V1 were beaten by nation states is that nation states had scale, mm -hmm. right? That's why San Marino is this ductile platypus. Nation states, like they just scooped up all of these small principalities into this huge thing because it had massive scale. And the problem with people who are like, you know, go back to city states or, you know, uh, you know, I want my small liberal land, like my sea land, my small country, and so on and so forth. It's sort of like the appeal to gold, where I understand why they want it. You know, hey, let's have lots of small governments and so on. But those small governments, the past was beaten by the present for a reason. The present has scale. Those nation states have scale. They have offensive capabilities. City states were defeated by nation states. Network states though, are a V3 in my view, and why? Because they combine some of the aspects of both nation and city states. So they have the scale or potential scale of a nation state, since in theory, you could have an international network um, that had uh, you know, millions of members. In fact, take a look at, uh, I've got a little GIF here because this, you know, sometimes a uh, picture what, what you're basically what, what you're basically talking about here, it, it's, it's fascinating because even if you look at something uh, across industries, it really is the analog world was a game of scale. And so naturally people would push into the digital realm. And if you take, I don't know, books, right? There's physical bookstores that usually were mom and pops. Then there got scale by then going to the chains of the Barnes and Nobles, whatever. Then Amazon came along and said, hey, we have a digital version that gives us more scale. And then eventually what people realized is like, we don't even have to create the actual physical book. We can just literally have a digital file. And so you can kind of see this progression across industry after industry after industry. And whoever basically gets to the, the end state the fastest uh, and does it in a sustainable way, they tend to have the advantage, it appears, you know, over the long run. Taking a look at this, right? Let's keep this GIF on loop for a second. So this probably tells the story like in a few, you know, frames faster than I could in words. So this is an example of a hypothetical network state that starts with one person in Tokyo, okay? And they recruit other people and they connect them together. And notice in the top right, they're crowdfunding territory, square meters of territory around the world to live together. Mm -hmm. And how are they doing it? In the top middle, the annual income is how much they're booking in, you know, let's say provable, it, it could be crypto income eventually, uh, or partially crypto income, but they basically have some proof of income in the middle, right? And one of the things I point out in the book is that the census uh, was actually, did you know the census is part of the US constitution, like the post office? I did not know. So it's actually, you know, it's actually something that they thought of as actually being very important from the very beginning. They needed information about their young republic in order to do something. It was a huge undertaking, which is why the census is only done every 10 years, mm -hmm. you know, because you have to take all this paper and, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen what a million pieces of paper looks like, but it's a lot of pieces of paper, right? And you didn't have Excel, you had to add up all of that by hand. Every cross tab had to be done by hand. Just imagine the warehouse and how people had to set it up, right? So now our census, you know, you can do something, not a million people every 10 years, but like Facebook in theory could compute and does actually have a real-time census on 3 billion people in a second, mm -hmm. okay? So that's like several orders of magnitude. You know, if you go, just think it out, right? 3,650 days is 10 years. And then you're doing that not in an hour, but in a second. That is like, you know, six or seven orders of magnitude improved in terms of your speed to go from 10 years to, to one second, right? And um, the, the point about that is, 
Now the problem is not the speed of the computation, but the reliability of it. Okay, how do you know? Before it was something where okay, is the US government going to fake their census? You know, okay, maybe maybe you trust them, maybe you wouldn't. But now anybody can put whatever number they want online. So this census for a network state, you're going to need a lot of the proof of X, proof of Y techniques we've talked about, like proof of human, proof of income, proof of real estate. All those things actually, the cryptographic proof that that transaction occurred with many different overlapping points of evidence, any one of which could be fallacious, but combined together, you get statistical inference, right? You have some estimate of, you know, how probable is it that this uh, number is correct, right? It's not going to be deterministic, it's going to be statistical. Even Bitcoin, for example, you know, the, um, the calculation that Satoshi put in the white paper is a statistical calculation of, of you know, how likely it is that. Uh, you know, uh, you're going to have finality after like six blocks. And so you do the statistical calculation, you're like, how reliable are these uh, population and income and uh, real estate footprints? And if that census is reliable, if you have managed to build a community that's like this, and there's more details that I talk about in the book, but if you, if you can build something at this scale of all these people who think of themselves as being part of the same nation, and who actually crowdfund territory and live together in it. And if you notice the buildings, if you go bring the, put the GIF back on screen, um, those uh, the, the buildings on the left hand side sort of increase in complexity. <laughs> so you know, right, the footprint starts getting larger in each of these cities. Right, it starts as like just one guy in his house, and eventually it becomes cul-de-sacs and ranches and small towns and maybe even small cities, and they're all networked together. And when I say they're all networked together, um, well. You know the the advent of augmented reality glasses, which I talk about coming. That's like the most predictable next thing in tech. Mm -hmm. You know, like the iPhone was this convergence device. The AR glasses that let you tap and then just boom, you you can just see ghosts from the internet in in real life. Those are going to make make it much easier to network all of these different physical regions together into something that feels like the same country, right? So, so just to so give you, let, let me ask you a question about this because I think. The number one critique, I was trying to think of like, what are the biggest critiques I've heard of uh, people saying around this network uh, state thesis? And the number one thing yep. that uh, I've seen people talking about is, okay, theoretically, this makes a ton of sense, but you still have to have the physical location, whether it's a building, whether it's land, whether it's whatever. How do those individuals in that building or land defend themselves from the existing nation state structure. So if you participate in the network state, how does that interface with the nation state? And do nation states view this as a threat or abrasive or do they embrace it? Like, like how do you think about those two uh, or maybe the line between the nation state and the network state blurring in the physical world where the network state still needs physical space? Great question. So actually I've got a whole section on this that I will add and then tweet out called uh, diplomatic relations, right? Between, because I talk about diplomatic recognition as this core part of it, right? So diplomatic relations between network states and nation states is actually, you know what it's similar to? It's similar to the crypto fiat interface. Ah, okay, explain. Because it's like the interface between cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and fiat currency, the US dollar, um, was not something that actually, uh, to my knowledge, at least Satoshi wrote about originally. He sort of thought that the crypto economy could bootstrap itself kind of completely on its own. He had like the poker thing that was built into the app at the beginning, right? But it turned out that the BTC USD interface, that exchange rate, once that exchange rate occurred, right? Um, and you could argue it occurred implicitly with the, the pizza day transaction, right? But mm -hmm. the exchange rate between BTC and USD, that is, you know, like future historians will see that as something that almost looks like it went zero to one, right? Like that it looks infinite or like it, like it just goes vertical because it's over, it's very fast over a short period of time. But while we're living through it, as you know, it has ups and downs and it retraces and so on and so forth um, before, you know, like maybe it'll go to infinity. I, I don't, we'll see. Okay. But the thing is that, um, ah, so this, this image, by the way, here, this shows a visual of what I'm talking about, where if you scroll down, right, that's, that's Apple's AR kit, which is a, a preview of what you'll see with your AR glasses. So if you hold a certain NFT, you see a glowing sigil, you're part of this secret society, this Freemasons or, or what have you. And all the people who have that NFT can see that sigil and, and nobody who doesn't can, right? And, uh, that means that you you have a layer over the world 
where citizenship becomes like single sign-on. You know, you have a private key, you have an NFT that is your digital passport, and you can literally see aspects of the world that others can't. It's like your physical login, right? And uh, so you can start to see how with something like that, you can take all these territories around the world and, you know, brand is uh, it's kind of an unfortunate term because it seems very corporate. But think about if you walk into the Google offices anywhere in the world, they're basically very similar. You know, they're meant to be similar. It's got the Google logo. Maybe there's like a little ethnic touch for that country, like the Google Doodle, but they're fundamentally very similar. And that's intentional. It's like a little piece of Google, a slice of Google around the world. But that's within the context of commercial real estate. These are all fundamentally commercial buildings, Mm -hmm. office space. What if you extended that to residential real estate and industrial, and you had all of those linked together and it wasn't a company, but a community that owned them, right? That you could do. And then the branding would be more like, you have a bunch of Chinatowns, for example, or little Indias around the world, but they're networked together. And now you actually start having something which nothing I'm describing is like technically infeasible. You know, all these little subroutines exist, right? Chinatowns exist, little Indias exist, Google exists, single sign-on exists, all those pieces exist, right? What I'm kind of talking about is the system integration of bringing them together into this, uh, you know, community that is physically distributed, but digitally connected in one place. And one way of thinking about this, by the way, is if you live in Hawaii, many people, in Hawaii, I mean, they think of themselves as part of the same country as somebody who lives in New York. Mm-hmm. Okay. They're not driving to New York. Um, in fact, they probably don't go off the island of Hawaii that frequently. So that gift that I just showed is actually not that different from how people live already. You know, they, like the, you don't need that much contiguous space in the middle. It's not flyover country. It is I'm probably, there's probably some clever one-liner you could have, but it's like teleport over a country, Mm -hmm. you know, because you're just sending the packets over, you know? Um, And so these other regions are as, you know, so long as your individual pockets are large enough. um, And that depends, you know, a person in just like one place on their own could kind of think of themselves as like a, just like an American expat living overseas, thinks of themselves as American, even if they're surrounded by a lot of foreign nationals, Right. Like a building that had just one person from a network state, that person would LARP themselves into thinking of themselves as part of this larger community. And once it gets to on the order of 100,000 to a million people, if and when it gets there, it's actually not that unreasonable a LARP. And the reason for that is that most countries are small countries. Actually, here's another graphic from the beginning of the book that I'll show you. I mean, in some way, what you're describing, there are um, crumbs of it already occurring. Uh, yes. Google is a good example, right? In terms of like, you think of yourself as, uh, I adhere to this, uh, community, which happens to be a for-profit company. There's physical space. Uh, there's a single sign on to get into the, uh, the internal, uh, systems. Uh, but you also can kind of extrapolate that out and you see, uh, people doing this in a variety of different ways. Um, it's just, no one's done it from an actual nation state, you know, transitioning to a network state, if you will. Right. And so if you take a look, for example, at this, um, just here's a way to calibrate like the, the reasonableness of this. Mm-hmm. If you go and look at this um, link that I just pasted in and scroll all the way down to the bottom, most countries are small countries. Mm-hmm. Okay. Only 14 countries are 100 million person countries. And the reason that that is counterintuitive is probably most people live in big countries, mm-hmm. but most countries are small countries, right? And so the thing about that is most of the countries at the United Nations are like, you know, like sub one, uh, sub 10 million, right? And as you know, we can build social networks of that scale. You know, I mean, it's not trivial to build, a, a, you know, a 10 million person social network, but it's definitely doable. And there's, there's, there's definitely a lot of people who have built, um, you know, 100K, 1 million person followings online, like you and I are, I think are at that level. That's not, that's not like that exceptional, Right. And so now, of course, there's a huge difference between like clicking a button and following somebody versus um, actually going and having a much higher level of commitment to think of yourself as part of the country. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the horizontal scale, we're there, right? Like we've got massive horizontal scale for like joining Facebook. And now, you know, the next level up from that, from spending hours and hours a day on something, which is actually a pretty big commitment, by the way, I should say, Um, the next step up from spending hours a day on a social network is starting to invest huge chunks of your net worth, like even 1% of your net worth, I would consider a huge chunk into a cryptocurrency. And so we may have billions of people spending hours on social media. We have hundreds of millions of people putting big chunks of their net worth into cryptocurrency. 
And so the next question is, will we have some significant fraction of people putting their lives into a crypto country? Mm -hmm. When you think, when you think of this, right? So use me as an example. I live in the United States of America. Many people would say, uh, it's a great place to live. Uh, people from all over the world want to constantly come here. There's the American dream, there's democracy, there's capitalism. There's all these kind of unique blend of things. Um, and let's say that that's on one end of the spectrum. Then there's going to be individuals who uh, are in a place where they're trying to leave, right? And, and they have a unique blend of uh, both advantages and disadvantages as to why somebody may want to stay or leave in that country. But if you put that spectrum out, like what changes for somebody in a Western developed nation if they want to kind of uh, transition into one of these crypto states? And what changes for the individual who is not in a Western developed nation, but wants to transition into a crypto state? Like, do they end up in the same place? They just came from two different uh, kind of starting it's points. It's a good question. So the thing is, uh, well, so the way there's a lot of things I can say there. So the first is uh, the U S is becoming less attractive as a destination for you know, so-called high net worth individuals. It's down about 86% since 2019. Henley Global has a report on this. They're also leaving China because, you know, it's like the common prosperity doctrine over there. They've cracked down on um, Jack Ma and all the tech founders and so on. They're leaving Russia, obviously. That's got the massive global outflux. They're leaving India, though they're getting replenished within India by like new founders, but it's, um, I think it's like net, net zero. But where are they going? They're going to small countries. And um, this has been a trend that's been going on for some time. And I think, so it's not, you know, the other thing is also like the concept of the developed world and the developing world. This is something which I think is, it's now probably worth deconstructing that. Um, and the reason is that the way I talk about it is the uh, ascending world and the descending world or the ascending class and the descending class, that's the individual version of it. So the reason I say that is, uh, you know, so here is, it's a, you know, do I want to call this an unfair comparison? I think it's um, it's partially fair, uh, but take a look at this. Um, this is an underrated there. Twitter account, by the way. Underrated account, yeah. So, so look at her comment, right? So, at first glance, I thought this was India, right? Uh -huh. Now, here's the thing: LA, yeah. a lot of people jumped on, jumped on her for that, right? And the thing is, India, you know, there's parts of India that did look like that, that do look like that. But then, if you go forward, here is. Here are some of the new Indian train stations. Mm -hmm. Like that's clean, and that's not. It's not. Unre that's like a random train station that people use. Go to the next one, right? Like the thing is, I'm not saying that all of India looks like this and so on, but parts of India do, and parts of America now look like the previous thing. Mm -hmm. And so the the distributions that were totally disjoint, you know, in the 80s, uh, that were basically like the richest Indian was poorer than the poorest American. Those are, you know, those are now like converging, right? Or is it, you know, an equilibrium is found where like, um, I, I don't really know how else to describe it other than like the United States, uh, was on this epic rise at some point. It just can't keep going up higher and higher because people get complacent, people get comfortable. Uh, and so naturally you would expect decline at some point. These other countries now are the U S you know, a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, they're now on ascent. And so you get that crossover point where, uh, the U S doesn't keep improving and growing. These other countries catch up and then you actually get the reverse. Like, is there a point in the future where India is, you know, the new U S and America is the old India? Yeah. So, right. So basically when I, when I talk about thing about India, by the way, I, I'm, I'm only, moderately bullish on India as a country, but I'm very bullish on Indians as a network, yes. like around the world, uh, including Indians within India, but basically Indians in general are just like leveling up and they're, they're having an impact on the world. I mean, it's like- They run know, every tech people. company. I mean, what, they run well, like yeah, every major tech company, right? Or, or at so, least 60% right, right. of the top ones. Yeah. And this is, well, I mean, they've done very well there and they've also, you know, Indians have done well in media and other places. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is this huge new phenomenon where um, I think, you know, so one way of thinking about it is if you look around your room and you're like, okay, how much of this physical world was made by, you know, effectively Chinese people in factories, right. Or, you know, Chinese entrepreneurs, I think you're going to see over the next 10 years, a very large fraction of the digital world will be made directly or indirectly by Indians. Interesting. 
Okay. So like an interesting kind of way of thinking about it. Right. And uh, that's, that's obviously like at the CEO level and so on, but I think an under underrated thing is uh, micro work, you know, outsourcing and like, you know, machine learning labeling of like cat and dog, you know, the digital assembly line, the new, the digital blue collar on Android phones for cryptocurrency, but basically where we're doing it earn, but like, you know, 10, a hundred, a thousand, a million X bigger, that is going to be a big thing. Um, where you just open up your phone and you can do micro work anywhere for a cryptocurrency, mm-hmm. like a Twitter feed, right? And uh, I think a lot of that is going to happen in India because it just kind of fits how people just, you know, think about things there, right? They're willing to do these sort of, you know, drudge type tasks. They've just got Android phones. They've got information, but like, you know, a dollar a day is still like a big deal for people there. So they will actually do a good job for something like that. And and also, I think this is a part that's not appreciated, Um you know, my, my friend, uh, Akshay, who actually, you know, I think he coined this term is basically like, um, Indians used to need the H1B visa, but now they have the TCP IP visa. Okay. So he has this podcast. That's pretty, good. Good. That's pretty good, right? Yeah, that's so, pretty good. <laughs> and the thing is like H1B visas, you know, they're, they, they're down and up and, you know, it seems like down and harder to get recently. But the thing is now you have, uh, you know, this, th- these graphs, again, this is stuff that hasn't really been reported in the U S but if you look at the um, adoption of, you know, 4G uh, or 5G rather, um, this is this is something which is just really kind of not on people's radars. You know, while the U.S. was kind of fighting this domestic civil war during the Trump years, and all attention was on the domestic kind of thing, almost a billion people got online in India from 2017 to 2021, and that's continuing, right? So what that means is all those folks are lurking in the comment section. Mm -hmm. They're all reading, right? And so a good chunk of your upvotes are Indian. A good chunk of your readers and listeners are gonna be Indian. And in fact, most of the English internet is gonna soon be Indian because- one, one, of the be, one of the best examples ahead. I have of this is in uh, 2015 or 2016, um, I went to India. I did like a two week um, trip and went to multiple cities and I kept meeting entrepreneurs and uh, they'd come up to me and they'd say, you know, hey, we've built X product. Uh, we have 100,000 users. And I remember being like, holy shit, like 100,000 users. And after like the ninth or 10th time, I turned to somebody who was there and I was like, how the hell are these people so good at growth? And he was like, no, 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 no. Like a hundred thousand users in <laughs> India is like 5,000 in the United States. Right. He's right, like, right, right. it's just a bigger country or whatever. And so I remember yeah. like, that was one of these things where I was like, oh, literally the scale of the opportunity just to get people in your local economy onto these products is going to be massive. Imagine if they're then able to scale them globally, like they are just used to building for scale and getting users at a, in a way that is uh, probably more difficult in the United States. And so it was just like this one little thing that just stuck out to me of like, man, this is so different than uh, kind of the United States and the way that we think about, you know, consumer products and, and growth. Right. And and the thing is that basically the integration of India with the global economy via the internet is a massive pro-globalization force mm-hmm. as per pull it, going back to our earlier thing. Like there's a billion people who really, 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 really want to work online for money and are willing to do so and can do art and computer programming and social media and blah, 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 like lots and lots of white collar digital labor kinds of jobs. Um, they don't need an H1B visa anymore and they're culturally acclimated. So, you know, they, they may speak with an accent, but they kind of know all the memes, right? They're, they're fluent in the memes. They've been growing up with the same memes. They've been lurking for the last five years and kind of learning all of that stuff. So, uh, you know, the first time I realized this was actually in the early 2010s when I, I taught this huge online course, massively open online course, actually one of the first, um, uh, first, I think, courses on Bitcoin uh, here. Let me show you this. I'm sure most people even know about this. Um, but in 2013, when Bitcoin was at double digits, uh, I taught this course and actually hit 250,000 people worldwide. So yeah, this is 2013, right? Build mm-hmm. Bitcoin crowdfunding. So 250,000 people, you know, when Bitcoin was at like 10 bucks or something, or not 10, but it's like double digits, like I think it was 60 bucks or something at that time. Um, so point being that uh, what I realized with that course is that the internet was to America as America was to the UK. It is like the more global, the more um, like 
internationalist, like, you know, the UK had all these innovations, like, um, you know, obviously common law, like all Englishmen are equal and, you know, many civilizational innovations. And then the US leveled up and it said, hey, you know, we're actually going to have a written constitution. And it's not just all Englishmen are equal, but all Europeans can come and immigrate and so on. And, um, you know, that built this amazing country. And then, you know, the next level, I think, is to go from common law to constitution to, uh, you know, cryptocurrency or to a smart contract, where it's not just like a written law with some judge who could enforce it, you know, as they see fit, but something where there's a compiler that's enforcing it. There's a there's a chain that's enforcing it. It's actually more um, more difficult to to abuse, and it's more impartial. A computer enforcing the law. And it's also something which is not just limited to those people who can get a visa in or something, but it is anybody with an internet connection, which is basically everybody. We've enfranchised billions of people. The phone is the next franchise in a real sense, because you've given all these people who didn't have a voice a voice. You've given them all a you know a way to, to make money online to build things. And uh, when you started putting all of that together, you're like, oh, okay, like the internet is to you know the Americas, it's like this, this new new world. Um, like what the new world was for the Europeans. And it is uh, it is something that I don't think people have realized its full potential and how large it is yet. As much as we talk about it, we still haven't really conceptualized it as such because you know the, the new world was seen uh, by, for many years by the European powers as just being the place for them to go and send boats. And of course, you know, obviously the Native Americans and South Americans, Mayans, because you know, I actually talk about that in the book, like um, there was a lot of warfare and, uh, you know, there's different ways that one can, can think about that, but the internet is different where, you know, there's nobody on the other side. It's like, you know, uh, there's nobody who's sitting on that server before you, it's a piece of just bare digital territory. So people think of it as just a place that, uh, America or Europe or India or China or what have you is just going to quote settle and, build American tech companies or Chinese tech companies. But over time, I think it takes on a logic of its own and has its own internet native nationalism where things like keto, for example, or CrossFit or, or Bitcoin um, are internet native things that are in a sense, genuinely international because they cut across all international boundaries and will eventually be able to acquire territory and form new nations of their own. Um, and that's a big part of what the book is about. Well, it, it's um, the addressable market is much bigger. I also think uh, a lot about uh, you and I have talked about media, uh, you know, a, a bunch of times. But I think there's many industries where um, I, I call it like the uh, the boardroom expansion plan, which is like mm -hmm. I build a company in the United States and I you know work really hard for three or four years, and then at some point I sit down with the board and I say, okay, board, I think now is time for international expansion. And we all debate sure. and we pick like let's go to England, right? Or let's go to, you know, Mexico or like wh wherever we want to go. Right. And it's like this very kind of methodical, you know, global expansion plan. And some of that's because, you know, if you're doing manufacturing or supply chain related things, there, there's a physical element. Yeah. Uh, yep. but you we, need the regulation certifications for yeah, those Yeah, but we've even seen this with just tech companies, right? I mean, th there was a big deal when like Airbnb said, hey, we are now are going to go and go into a certain geography. And I think yep. what has happened now uh, is just like people turn it on. It's a global you know, effort. Uh, and look, I was at Facebook when, uh, internet.org was a, uh, a big focus of, uh, the business and they were trying to bring internet. And the joke always, you know, kind of was like, Hey, we're running out of people on Facebook. So like, let's go get more people on the internet to get them on Facebook. Uh, and there okay. probably was some hint of truth to it, but, but I do think that most of the effort was genuine in like giving people internet sure. access is, is a, a net positive. Google at the same time was flying, you know, hot air Project balloons balloon. and yeah, doing yeah. all this stuff. But if you fast forward now and you say like those internet companies are going to actually lose that internet race to Starlink and SpaceX. And it mm -hmm. was, yeah. you know, it was somebody who started in a 